we are honored to have Dr. Kathy Giacomini give today's lecture. Dr. Giacomini is professor in the Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Science at the University of California, San Francisco, and co-principal investigator of the NIH's PGRN hub. In addition, Dr. Giacomini is the co-principal investigator of the UCSF Stanford Center of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, a major center funded by the FDA with the goal of advancing scientific issues related to the safe and effective use of medical products. She received her PhD in pharmaceutical science from the State University of New York at Buffalo and completed postdoctoral fellowship training at Stanford University. Dr. Giacomini is considered a leader in the field of membrane transporters. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Please enjoy the presentation today. Hello, I'm Kathy Giacomini. I'm a professor at University of California, San Francisco. Um, my research area is in membrane transporters, and today I'm going to talk to you about membrane transporters in clinical pharmacology, and I'm going to emphasize the aspects of membrane transporters that I feel practicing clinical pharmacologists need to know about. So I've divided my talk into three major sections. Um, first, I'm going to be talking about basic transporter biology, and I'll give a brief overview here in that area. And that will be followed by two aspects of membrane transporters that are important to clinical pharmacologists. The first is transporters as mediators of drug-drug interactions, which is very important for drug safety. And the second will be transporter polymorphisms, or pharmacogenomic studies, uh, which are relevant to membrane transporters and to clinical pharmacology. So let me begin with um, basic transporter biology. Um, all right. I begin each one of these sections with key points, and I will end on the same key points. So the key points that I'm interested in making here and that I feel is important for you as future clinical pharmacologists is, first of all, transporters are important in drug disposition and response, and those are generally in two major superfamilies, the solute carrier superfamily, SLC, and the ATP binding cassette superfamily, ABC. Second point is transporters are integral membrane proteins with multiple transmembrane domains, which, in, which facilitate membrane passage of their substrates. Um, and the third point is transporters may be primary active, secondarily active, or facilitated, and their kinetics follow Michaelis-Menten equations. Okay, so this slide reminds us that transporters are expressed on cellular membranes, and I'm just reminding you that there are many cellular membranes in, within one cell. So there are mitochondrial membranes, lysosomal membranes, membranes in the Golgi or endoplasmic reticulum, and each one of these subcellular organelles have membrane transporters which shuttle compounds in and out uh, of the organelle. Uh, but the most important place um, that transporters are expressed for clinical pharmacologists is on the plasma membrane, and I'm showing you that right here. And all of the transporters that I'll be talking about today are plasma membrane transporters. This slide is to remind me of and remind you that um, the plasma membrane, and indeed all cellular membranes, are hydrophobic. And as such, they control access to the intracellular environment. Um, and molecules really have to uh, get across that plasma membrane, and few of them can without the aid of some kind of a protein, and those proteins are usually are termed transporter proteins. Okay, so transporters are, are needed for hydrophilic substrates to cross biomembranes. Um, and for molecules which are hydrophobic, they can cross biological membranes by simple diffusion, and you can see that process right here. And these molecules are hydrophobic. They do not require a protein to traverse the plasma membrane. However, many other molecules, especially hydrophilic molecules, do require uh, membrane proteins and transporters, per se, to cross the plasma membrane. And I'm showing you here different types of transporters, which I'll describe in detail um, in the subsequent slides. Um, but I want to remind you that anything 
that is transported via a transporter is called facilitated transport. And facilitated transport, um, which is facilitated, if you will, by a transporter, can be divided into two major class categories. One is facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion doesn't require energy. It moves substrates in and out, actually, of a cell uh, across the plasma membrane in accordance with the electrochemical gradient. Um, the second process um, is called active transport. Active transport requires energy and may move substrates against a concentration gradient, for, so from low concentration to high concentration, and I'll describe facilitated transporters and active transporters in the next few slides. So here I'm showing you three different transport mechanisms, um, a uniport, an antiport, and a symport. And let's begin first with a uniport transport mechanism. A uniport transport mechanism is a simple way that there's a transport protein in the cell membrane, and it's traverse, and the molecules, the substrates shown here in orange, are traversing down the concentration gradient, and the, tra and, the pl and the transporter is being used, if you will, to facilitate that crossing of that hydrophilic molecule, which is not going to cross uh, the lipid bilayer without this transport protein. So one molecule, the substrate moving through, is a uniport mechanism. And then there are two other uh, processes that I'm showing you here are transport mechanisms, symporters and antiporters. Let me describe an antiporter first. So an antiport mechanism, the substrate shown here, is moving here, maybe downhill or maybe uphill. Uh, in, in accordance with the electrochemical gradient, but it's exchanging with, um, with another counter ion or an ion, and that purple is that ion. That ion may be a proton gradient, that ion may be some a chloride uh, molecule, some kind of, an, of a solute is moving in exchange for the movement of the substrate, and so it's an exchange mechanism. Um, a very well-known exchanger that works in this way that we will be discussing later on is uh, multidrug and toxin extrusion protein, MATE1. The third mechanism that I'm showing on this slide is a symporter. Symporters are quite important, and there's a very well-known symporter, the sodium, um, uh, the serotonin, uh, transporter, uh, which is a sodium serotonin symport mechanism. So here would be serotonin moving across the plasma membrane into the cell, and over here um, is um, uh, maybe the uh, sodium molecule moving also together with um, uh, with uh, serotonin, actually driving um, the the uphill movement of serotonin uh, from, uh, from maybe a, a, a lower concentration to uh, a higher concentration. Um, transporters exhibit characteristic uh, kinetic properties. Um, they are saturable, um, they are inhibitable, and they are temperature dependent. So saturable is a property that we're all aware of with the transport mechanism. That is, the transport mechanism will increase as concentration increases, and then a maximum rate uh, will be achieved. And that maximum rate will depend on um, a couple of things. One is the number of transporters in the plasma membrane. Secondly, transporters are inhibitable. That is, another substrate or a so-called inhibitor may inhibit the transport of a test substrate. Um, so that's the second property that characterizes a transporter. And third is transporters are very temperature dependent. That is, at low temperatures, they work very poorly. They have an optimal temperature. It's usually 37 degrees, um, um, which is, you know, our biological temperature. Um, so let's examine that property of saturability. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is a transport kinetic uh, properties of two molecules. One molecule is going by simple diffusion, and the other by a carrier-mediated process or a transporter. Um, the simple diffusion, the molecule that's diffusing, going by simple diffusion, we're plotting here solute concentration, so this is increasing concentration, um, and we're pro plotting on the y-axis rate of transport. So this is increasing rate of transport. And you can see a molecule that uh, 
uh, crosses a biological membrane by simple diffusion, its rate of transport is just plain linear. As concentration increases, the rate of transport increases. However, a carrier-mediated process, or a transporter-mediated process, will also do the same at lower concentrations. That is, as concentration increases, the rate of transport will increase, and then it will saturate, and you will get to a maximum transport rate, the so-called Vmax. Um, and so that's one of the properties of, of a uh, transporter, is that there will be a Vmax. That Vmax is dependent on the transporter and the particular substrate that's being transported. The other uh, kinetic parameter that characterizes this transport process is a Km. Um, so this slide, the, what I'm showing you here now is the equation. Uh, for something, uh, for a compound which diffuses. So rate of diffusion is simply directly proportional to the concentration of the molecule which is diffus diffusing, and that proportionality constant is often called a diffusion rate constant, Kd. Um, for the saturable process, um, now we have the typical Michaelis-Menten equation, where the rate of transport at low concentrations is linear, uh, but it's characterized by a Vmax when you get to the higher concentrations. It's also characterized by a Km, and as you may remember, the Km is the concentration of the solute or the substrate which is being transported um, at half the maximum uh, velocity or transport rate. So you find half the Vmax right here, and you look for that concentration, and that concentration is the Km. So this Michaelis-Menten equation, which characterizes many enzymatic processes that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, also characterizes transport processes. Sometimes Vmax for transporters, rather than being termed maximum velocity, is termed Tmax, transport maximum. But it's the same thing. It means the maximum rate of transport. And as I said, it's characteristic of the transport and the substrate that it's transporting. Now I'm going to describe uh, the major transporters um, and the major transporter families that we have to be interested in as clinical pharmacologists or aware of. The first is the solute carrier superfamily. And I'm showing you here um, the superfamily, which is clustered according to homology relationships. And there are 400 transporters here clustered according to 25% homology relationships into over 50 distinct families. Um, so there's a wealth of solute carrier uh, transporters in the human genome. This is only in the human genome. If we were to go to other species, there'd be even more, um, even all the way down to very simple single-cell organisms. Transporters characterize very simple single-cell organisms like bacteria. Um, these solute carrier superfamily transporters are all facilitated transporters in one way or the other. They may be uniporters, as I showed you on the previous slide. They may be antiporters or symporters. Um, so they may move substance, their substrates against a concentration gradient um, in accordance with a gradient of, for example, a sodium ion gradient, uh, like the serotonin transporter. But they do not rely directly on ATP hydrolysis. So they are not ATP binding uh, cassette family members. They are distinct from, from that major superfamily, which I'll describe in a minute. Now, as clinical pharmacologists, you have to keep your eye on many of these transporters because many of them will be drug targets, um, and many of them may play a role in drug disposition. But I have today a focus very clearly uh, this lecture on transporters that play an important role in many different drugs. Uh, so we won't have to think about every one of these uh, 400 or so transporters in the SLC uh, superfamily. Notable SLC transporters that I will be talking about today are transporters in the SLC22 family or organic ion transporters. Um, and SLC22A1 is organic cation transporter 1, or encodes organic cation transporter 1. In fact, all the transporters, by the way, in the SLC superfamily have an SLC designation for their gene name, and they may have a familiar name like organic cation transporter 1 for the protein name. So uh, OCT1, and they also have an abbreviation like OCT1. The protein name often has an abbreviation. So SLC22A1 is the gene. 
Organic cation transporter 1 um, is the name of the protein that is encoded by the gene, and OCT1 is the familiar name that you'll, you'll be familiar with when you read the literature. Um, and then I'm also showing you organic cation transporter 2. And the difference between these two transporters is they're encoded by two distinct genes. One is in the liver, this one, and one is in the kidney, this one. And they're also expressed in other uh, uh, organs in the body or other tissues in the body, but they're largely expressed in these two organs and, as you can imagine, play a role in hepatic disposition of drugs and renal disposition of drugs. So they're very important for drug elimination. Um, an another notable SLC uh, transporter uh, uh, family member that I'm going to describe today that clinical pharmacologists should know about is OATP1B1. That is the familiar protein name of this transporter, which is encoded by the gene SLC01B1. Um, and that is an organic anion uh, transporting polypeptide B1. It's found in the liver. We'll describe it a little bit later on. It brings a whole lot of drugs into the liver where they can be metabolized or interact with their biological receptors. And right on the same locus in the same chromosome uh, and right adjacent to SLCO1B1 is SLCO1B3. And that is also expressed, that, that, that gene is also expressed on the plasma membrane, on the sinusoidal membrane of the liver, and it encodes OATP1B3, also a very important transporter protein that I'll mention a little bit later. All right, so those are the notable SLC transporters, and remember that SLC transporters are facilitated transporters. They do not rely directly on ATP hydrolysis. They may be coupled to an ion gradient, or they may function as uniport transport mechanisms. Now I'm going to go to the other superfamily, and that is the ATP binding cassette superfamily. And this is also important for um, drug disposition and response, transporters in this particular superfamily. Here, instead of, you know, uh, 50 different families with 400 different uh, transporters, there are seven different families in the, in the human genome, and they encode some 48 different uh, transporters. Now, the transporters, the superfamily, uh, the families within this superfamily that are important and that we will be describing today are ABCB family, the ABCC family, and the ABCG family. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, transporters in these three different uh, families. But the main thing to note, and I'm showing you here uh, a molecule, an ATP binding uh, a cartoon representation of an ABC transporter, and this is intracellular and this is extracellular. Well, um, as the name suggests, ATP binding cassette or ABC uh, transporter family, these transporters, in contrast to the SLCs, rely on ATP hydrolysis, um, and they will directly pump uh, their substrates um, against a concentration gradient and directly using the energy supplied by um, ATP. Um, they are all the ones in the, in the human genome that we, will that we will talk about today are efflux pumps. And so we have to think about them, whereas the SLC transporters move their substrates in accordance with the electrochemical gradient or, or the ion gradient that they're coupled with. ABC transporters are effluxing their substrates, and we'll talk about that in the next slides. So the notable ABC transporters that you will learn a lot about um, um, is, um, are ABCB family members, and the most important one, in fact, probably the most well-known transporter in the human genome is ABCB1. That is the G name, the protein name, just like the SLCs, there's a protein name, is P-glycoprotein, and the abbreviation is PGP. Um, and there's another ABC trans B family member, ABCB11, which is BCEP, the bile salt export pump. I won't be describing this transporter much in this particular lecture, but I will say a word or two about PGP. And then the ABCC family members that are very important in clinical pharmacology are ABCC2 and ABCC4. These transporters are in the liver, 
Um, they may be in other organs as well, the kidney, for example, but they're notable in the liver um, and sometimes in the kidney. And they're multi-drug resistance proteins, uh, and they are MRP2 and MRP4. And I probably won't talk too much about these two transporters, just know that they play a role in multiple drugs, um, and they play a role in their hepatic and renal disposition. And the final protein that I will be spending a little bit of time on today is ABCG family member, ABCG2, encoding a protein called the breast cancer resistance protein, or BCRP. Um, and BCRP was discovered, as its name would imply, as an efflux pump in breast cancer uh, cells, which pump chemotherapeutic agents out of the cells uh, and therefore confer resistance um, of the breast cancer to chemotherapeutic agents. So um, I'm not going to describe that part of the role today, but I will talk about the more endogenous role of this transporter playing a role in drug disposition and response um, in, pa in many patients. So let me bring up my key points and just re-review them again in basic transporter biology. So number one, transporters, which are important in drug disposition in response, are generally found in two major superfamilies, the solute carrier superfamily, SLC, and the ATP binding cassette superfamily, ABC. The solute carrier superfamily, SLC, remember, is a facilitated, encodes and facilitated uh, transporters, which may be secondary active or may be simple facilitated diffusion transport transporters. The ABC um, superfamily um, is comprised of transporters which rely on, directly rely on hydrolysis of ATP, pump their substrates against a concentration gradient, and are efflux pumps in the human genome. Transporters are integral membrane proteins with multiple transmembrane domains. They facilitate membrane passage of their substrates. In general, the substrates are hydrophilic and would not diffuse, but they may also interact with hydrophobic substrates. Thirdly, transporters may be primary active, and that primary active means it, they directly rely on hydrolysis of ATP for their energy source, secondarily active, which means they rely on coupling to an ion gradient, like a symporter or an antiporter, or just plain simple facilitated transport mechanisms, which are the uniporters that I described in an earlier slide. They follow Michaelis-Menten equations. Their kinetic properties follow Michaelis-Menten equations, which basically means that they will exhibit the property of saturability. When you get to high concentrations, they will go at a, va at a maximum transport rate. And they will also exhibit the property of, um, of, uh, of, of a, they will also have a, be characterized by a Km, a Km being the concentration of the substrate at half the maximal transport rate. So those are my key points in the basic transporter biology uh, part of this lecture. We've concluded the basic transporter biology overview section, and I'm now going to turn to clinical pharmacology and transporters that are important for clinical pharmacologists. And the first uh, topic that I've selected is transporters as mediators of drug-drug interactions. Um, and then I'll segue from there to transporter polymorphism. So let's start with transporters as mediators of drug-drug interactions. I've listed here some key references for you, um, and one of them, the top one in Nature Review's Drug Discovery, I suggest everyone reads because that really is, um, that really uh, ushered in the whole area of transporters in drug-drug interactions, and it was published in 2010 in Nature Review's Drug Discovery by the International Transporter Consortium, and I'm showing you their logo up here. Um, and then I've listed two other um, uh, references uh, on transporter-mediated drug-drug interactions. Now, as with the other section, I have some key points that I'd like to make in this particular section. One is that there are key transporters that are potential mediators of drug-drug interactions. It's not all the transporters I showed, uh, for example, all the 400 SLC transporters that I showed in one of my earlier slides. It's really focused on these particular transporters that I'm listing here. PGP, 
which we described earlier, an ABC transporter, BCRP, also an ABC transporters, and then OC2, MATE1, and MATE2K, those are in the kidney, OAT1 and OAT3 in the kidney, and OATP1B1 and 1B3 in the liver. So we will be discussing this for my key points. Second key point, there are decision trees, uh, which the FDA has created, which will inform clinical pharmacologists on, uh, on whether to con conduct a transporter-mediated drug-drug interaction study, clinical study. And those decision trees have been described. They are well-published and uh, well-known, and I'm going to describe how you would use a decision tree to help inform you on whether you want to do a clinical drug-drug interaction study. The third uh, key point is there are two major types of decision trees, substrate-based and inhibitor-based, and I will describe those as well. And finally, inhibitor decision trees require a knowledge of the drug concentrations in vivo and the in vitro inhibitory constants. And I'll describe that briefly. So let me begin this part of the lecture. So first of all, let's go back to the early 2000s. Um, and, and I don't know, some of you may remember, but a very well-known statin was withdrawn from the market because of fatalities. Um, and that was cerevastatin. It was withdrawn from the market in 2001 because rhabdomyolysis, a life-threatening side effect to this particular statin, and actually to many statins, although rare for the other ones, but more common for cerevastatin, uh, was, had, had occurred in a number of patients. And I think there were like 52 fatalities uh, uh, which were attributed to cerevastatin because of rhabdomyolysis. So it was withdrawn from the market. And at that point in time, they recognized that a drug-drug interaction may have been the cause of the withdrawal, and I'll describe that. Um, so the, they noted that patients who were also on cerevastatin and gemfibrozole, those patients were at a higher risk for rhabdomyolysis. And so when they went back and examined this, or when the scientific community went back and examined what was the cause of this, it turned out that there was a drug-drug interaction, but it was not mediated by an enzyme. Prior to that date, all drug-drug interactions had been thought to be mediated by drug metabolizing enzymes, certainly important ones, important ones. It was mediated in part by a transporter. So I'm showing you here uh, sort of a historical study where you're looking at cerevastatin plasma levels in the lower curve here um, in a group of, uh, of patients, probably healthy volunteers here. Um, and then cerevastatin plasma levels when it was administered concomitantly with gemfibrozole. And you can see the levels are four to five times higher. So gemfibrozole has caused a drug-drug interaction, and the plasma levels of cerevastatin are much higher in patients who would be on gemfibrozole together with cerevastatin. And that may have been why patients who were on gemfibrozole um, were at higher risk for cerevastatin-induced rhabdomyolysis. And when the mechanism uh, was delineated, it turns out that, it was, that this interaction was mediated by OATP1B1, that hepatic transporter that I highlighted earlier and that I'll describe in a little more detail in a subsequent slide, and also by an enzyme CYP2C8. But it's OATP1B1 seemed to be the major site for this drug-drug interaction. So what happened is cerevastatin was going into the hepatocyte, I'll just call it cerev, it's going into the hepatocyte where it's metabolized by CYP2C8. However, when gemfibrozole, uh, or gemfibrozole was on board, it inhibited OATP1B1. So cerevastatin could not enter the hepatocyte, it was blocked, and its levels went up, and that's what you're seeing here, those higher levels.
And so it became recognized in 2001 that transporters play a critical role in drug-drug interactions and may be very important in the safe use of medications. And so what happened at that time was there was an explosion in the world of which transporters, which ones are causing this besides OATP1B1. Um, and that's when the International Transporter Consortium uh, was formed. And what we did and I was one of the people who played a role in forming the International Transporter Consortium, is we began to curate the literature. And we published this paper that I highlighted earlier in Nature Review's Drug Discovery in 2010. And we said it wasn't all those transporters that people had to worry about. There were just a few that were very important in mediating drug-drug interactions, and those were the ones that people, drug developers had to think about and clinical pharmacologists had to think about um, in terms of both their research and patient practice. Um, and so how did we identify those transporters? We looked in the literature uh, for transporters that had a high level of evidence that they played a role in drug disposition. And there had to be in vitro evidence, I'll write that here in vitro. So that means in a cell-based assay, we had to show that the transporter was mediating the transport of drugs. And then we looked for clinical evidence. That is, there were some clinical evidence that that transporter was causing or was responsible in some way for a drug-drug interaction. So there had to be several lines of evidence here. And we also looked at genetic polymorphisms, but I'll save that until the last part of my talk. After that paper was published, two years later, the FDA published a guidance for industry, and it was on drug-drug interactions. And in the guidance were decision trees, and I'll be describing decision trees. Those same decision trees, well, not the identical ones, but similar decision trees had been published in the earlier paper by the International Transporter Consortium, which, by the way, is a consortium of academic scientists, industry scientists, and FDA scientists. So it really is a very good consortium to really look over the literature and describe what are the important transporters uh, for, that mediate drug-drug interactions. Uh, and from the ITC, and I'm going to unhighlight that so you can see, from um, the International Transporter Consortium recommendations, these transporters appeared as being most important. And I'll describe those on the next slides. So let's start with the intestine. So what you're looking at over here is, you know, a representation of the intestine, some artist rendition of the intestine. And I'm reminding you of an intestinal epithelial cell. Here is the intestinal lumen over here. And over here is the blood side. So when you take a drug, it starts out in the lumen, and then it may be absorbed, and then it crosses into the blood this way crosses that intestinal epithelial membrane into the portal circulation uh, during the drug absorption process. In the intestine, two major transporters were called out by the ITC and subsequently in the FDA guidance. One is P-glycoprotein and the second is BCRP. As you may recall, both of those are ABC transporters. They rely on ATP hydrolysis. They efflux their substrate. So what you can imagine these two transporters are doing is they are preventing drug absorption, right? Because they're keeping the drug in the intestine, intestinal lumen. Um, but they can mediate drug-drug interactions. Um, and if one were to inhibit one of these, then it couldn't efflux a drug, and more drug may be absorbed. Um, and so um, we'll describe that uh, later. So those were the two that were called out in the intestine. I'm showing you in this smaller font other transporters are there, just to remind you that there are a host of transporters that do play a role in drug absorption, but these weren't called out as the most important transporters that clinical pharmacologists and drug developers need to be aware of. Um, this uh, cartoon, and let me erase the intestinal piece, um, shows now the transporters that were highlighted that played a role in hepatic drug disposition. Um, and so here's the liver, and what you're looking at here is the sinusoidal membrane. So that faces the blood, and then 
this is in the portal circulation, the portal blood and the hepatic arteries, they enter the liver and uh, the drug will be present in the, in the sinusoids and may enter the hepatocyte where the drugs may be metabolized. Over here we have the canalicular membrane. Uh, and the canalicular membrane lines the bile duct, or goes into the bile duct. And there are transporters there, which may move drugs from the hepatocyte into the bile. And two transporters were called out as very important on that membrane. BCRP, yet again, it's found in the intestine uh, on the luminal membrane or the apical membrane. It's also in the canalicular membrane in the hepatocyte and PGP. Um, and then on the on the basal lateral membrane, or the sinusoidal membrane, uh, OATP1B1 and OATP1B3, those SLC transporters, mediate influx. And the one that I described in my opening uh, remarks to this particular section um, that, mediate, that mediated the interaction between gemfibrozole and, um, and cerevastatin, OATP1B1. So those were called out as being very important transporters that people should be uh, aware of. OCT1, organic cation transporter 1, was not in the initial guidance of the FDA. They are in the process of publishing a second guidance, and it may appear. I'm not sure. Uh, this is an organic cation transport, so it transports basic drugs, unlike OATP1B1, which is mostly transporting uh, acidic drugs. Um, and it also plays a role in drug disposition, but has yet to be called out by the International Transporter Consortium or the FDA. Um, now, moving on to the kidney, um, several transporters play a role in renal drug elimination. So here again, you're looking at a proximal tubule, you're looking at a cell, and this is a proximal tubule cell, and over here is the lumen or the urine side, and over here is the blood side. And so drugs which are actively secreted have to traverse both membranes to get into the urine. And the transporters that play a role in basic drug renal secretion are OC2 on this membrane, bringing drugs from the blood into the tubule cell. And on this membrane, MATE1 and MATE2, I've just shown it here, and they bring basic drugs into the tubule limit. For anionic drugs or acidic molecules, organic anion transporter 1 and 3, O1 and O3, move the drugs from the blood into the uh, proximal tubule cell, and then those drugs may move out by a variety of different transporters, maybe PGP, BCRP, and some other transporters here. So the transporters that have been called out that are sites for drug-drug interactions are PGP, BCRP in the intestine and over here in the liver, and OATP1B1, OATP1B3, and then in the kidney, OC2, OAT1, OAT3, and MATE1 and 2, and, and again, PGP and BCRP play a role there. I want to highlight for you um, that there are many transporter sort of databases, and one of them is here at UCSF. It's UCSF FDA Transportal, and it lists a number of in vitro and in vivo um, uh, potential drug-drug uh, interactions and, and data uh, that have to do with, tr with drugs, transporters, uh, maybe Michaelis-Menten parameters for in vitro. For in vivo, it really describes, the database will describe the um, clinical drug-drug interaction and also give you references that you can link to uh, in PubMed. So there are, there are databases that you can look up transporter-mediated drug-drug interaction studies, either in vitro or in vivo, get information from those databases and identify um, references. But those tend to be for more historical drugs. For newer drug molecules, the database uh, is not yet, is not being updated at this point in time. All right, I'd like to now turn to the decision trees that I've been talking about. So you're developing a drug. So clinical pharmacologists, just uh, as you're all aware, play a role in therapeutics. They play a role in academic institutions, but they're also found in industry. And in industry, clinical pharmacologists need to be aware of uh, when to conduct a clinical drug-drug interaction study and one that's transporter-mediated. 
And so here, the FDA, and I've taken this from the FDA 2012 uh, guidance, uh, set up a decision, set up some decision trees. And I'm showing you here the decision trees, sort of an overview of decision trees for substrates, not inhibitors. So you have a drug, which may be a substrate of one of these transporters. Could it be involved in a drug, or a victim, if you will, of a drug-drug interaction? And the decision trees are um, divided into um, three major categories, PGP and BCRP, um, OATP 1B1 and 1B3, and then renal transporters, the OATS, the OCT2, and MATE1. I'm only going to describe one aspect of the de decision tree. I'm only going to focus today on PGP, um, on really on PGP, although the same principles will apply for BCRP. I've listed here the URL um, where you can find these guidances, but really you can simply Google uh, FDA guidance drug-drug interactions and you'll find the various guidances and the updated guidances uh, that are being published by the FDA. Um, so let me start with PGP. So reminding you that um, PGP sits um, on the luminal membrane or the apical membrane of the intestinal epithelium. Um, it's effluxing its substrate, so it's really preventing drug absorption, if you will, or sort of limiting drug absorption. So its substrates are moving in this direction here, from, if you will, the blood side back into the intestinal lumen. And if you have a particularly good PGP substrate, PGP will keep that drug from being absorbed. And many drugs that are PGP uh, substrates may have bioavailabilities of around, you know, 20, 30 percent, low bioavailabilities depending upon uh, the degree of uh, interaction of the drug with PGP. So you can imagine a drug-drug interaction here would be very important because if you had an inhibitor of PGP, a drug which inhibited PGP and you were developing a substrate, that inhibitor could actually cause your drug to be absorbed more because it would not be uh, effluxed. And so you'd get more absorption, you'd get higher drug levels, um, increased C levels, the drug concentration levels, and potential toxicities. Um, so very important to understand whether a new drug in development is a PGP um, substrate. So the way that's done is an in vitro study. And remember, these guidances really uh, are instructing people to conduct in vitro studies and use that in those in vitro studies and perhaps some modeling to inform whether or not you want to do a clinical study and what that clinical study should look like a little bit. So the in vitro system for studying PGP is a transwell system. And what a transwell system is, it's a well within a well. And so this is the first well here, shown in this uh, more royal blue. And then in the turquoise blue is the within the well, the well, uh, the outside well. Um, and right here on this membrane is a permeable membrane. And you seed your cells. And your cells may be CACO2 cells or intestinal epithelial cells that are overexpressing PGP. Um, but they're polarized cells, and their apical membrane uh, is facing upward, just like over here. This is the apical membrane here. And you put your drug, your new substrate, you put your drug um, into the inner compartment here, and you measure the flux from compartment A, this is called compartment A, the apical compartment, to compartment B, the basal compartment. So you measure this flux from A to B. Um, now. That experiment is done. You do a subsequent experiment um, where you put the drug on this side, over here, on the basal compartment, and you measure the flux in the other direction, B to A. So you have an A to B flux and a B to A flux. If there were absolutely no transporter involved, A to B should be equal to B to A. The flux should go uh, at the same rate in, in both directions. However, if there is an efflux pump, what do you think would happen? The B to A flux is going to go in a greater rate than the A to B flux. Um, so you take a flux ratio, B to A divided by A to B. And if that flux ratio is greater than 2, 
maybe it's a PGP substrate, right? Because it's being fluxed into the apical side at a much greater rate, or at least twofold greater, than it's being fluxed uh, into the basal compartment. So after you've determined that flux ratio, if the flux ratio is greater than two, you may say to yourself, hmm, this looks like a PGP substrate, but you have to do uh, another experiment because there may be other ABC transporters in that membrane. Maybe, you know, transporters you hadn't thought about because, you know, the cell membrane, it's a cell membrane and it has other transporters. So you put in a PGP inhibitor and one such inhibitor may be verapamil. Um, that, that, but there are other inhibitors that you could use. Um, so you put in verapamil, rifampicin, a PGP substrate or an inhibitor, but one that will inhibit. And what should that inhibitor do? Well, that should reduce B to A flux because you're inhibiting PGP influx. So A to B to B to A flux might go back to one, you know, because you're in, you're you're um, <clears throat> reducing the um, the flux, the active transport flux by PGP into the apical compartment. So you add that inhibitor, and if the inhibitor reduces the B to A flux or changes the flux ratio from 2, for example, or 10, whatever it is, greater than 2, back down to 1 or, you know, just reduces it, it probably means the drug is a substrate of PGP. Um, so now you have some in vitro evidence, and let me take you to the decision tree. And let's just walk through it step by step. So the first thing you do is you set up your bidirectional flux assay, and you ask whether the flux ratio is greater than two. So this is step one. And you get a decision. It's a decision tree, so you get yes or no. So let's say no, it's less than two. End of story. It is not a PGP substrate, or it's a poor PGP substrate, and you don't have to be concerned with a clinical drug-drug interaction study. Um, however, if the ratio is greater than two, now you're a little bit aware that this, um, that this is, could be potentially important, so you add an inhibitor. If the inhibitor doesn't inhibit the flux ratio and it stays at 2 or 10 or whatever, it stays at something, it's not inhibited, then other transporters, not PGP, are responsible for that greater B to A flux than A to B flux. If, however, so again, you're going to have to now figure out what those other transporters may be. However, if the flux ratio is greater than two, it's inhibited by one or more PGP substrates, um, then you can conclude here in the green, yes, it's probably a PGP substrate. PGP may be playing an important role in its absorption and may be limiting its bioavailability. There may be a need for a drug-drug interaction study. And there, the FDA gives some guidances as to what you might consider, what, because your drug is a substrate, right? And so now you want to in, in, administer your drug with an inhibitor of PGP and see if your drug levels go up. Um, and so they might suggest give it with amiodarone, ketoconazole, cyclosporine. It'll depend upon the therapeutic class of your molecule uh, and other considerations, um, which you can plan and together uh, work out a plan for a drug-drug interaction study. So this gives you an idea of a decision tree where an in vitro information, which are much less expensive and much uh, quicker to conduct, uh, can provide information on whether or not to conduct a clinical drug-drug interaction study. The FDA has similar decision trees for inhibitors. Instead of your drug being a substrate of PGP, what if it's not really a substrate, but it inhibits PGP? Now it's going to per perpetrate drug-drug interactions. Won't be a victim of a drug-drug interaction, but it'll cause interactions with other drugs, and that could be an important concern. So there are inhibitor decision trees as well that I'm not going to go through, but they will be very similar. You just walk down. The in vitro methods are very well described. There are criteria, and those criteria trigger or not a clinical drug-drug interaction uh, study. So let's go back to the key points of the drug-drug interaction part of this uh, lecture. So first of all, the transporters that you have to be most concerned with that are responsible and mediators of many clinical drug-drug interactions include PGP, BCRP, the ABC transporters, in the kidney, OCT2, MATE1 and MATE2K, 
for um, drugs which are actively secreted, and these, these transporters take up basic drugs. OAT1 and OAT3, also in the kidney, for acidic drugs, which are actively secreted, and then OATP1B1 and OATP1B3 in the liver, bringing a number of drugs into the liver um, where they can be uh, metabolized or interact with their targets. So key point one, these are the transporters you need to know about. Key point two is there are decision trees, uh, and they will inform you using in vitro studies um, whether or not to conduct a transporter-mediated drug-drug interaction, and then which transporter you need to focus on, and some information from those studies about what drugs uh, you may need to use in your drug-drug interaction study. There are two major types of decision trees, substrate-based and inhibitor-based. Uh, we went over the substrate-based uh, decision tree, but you can go over the inhibitor-based decision trees. Those are very um, clear. And in the inhibitor-based decision tree, that will require a knowledge of the kinetic properties in vitro as well as the maximum concentrations in the plasma in vivo um, in the inhibitor decision tree. So that uh, concludes the second part on, uh, of my lecture on clinical pharmacology and transporter-mediated drug-drug interactions. Okay, in this section, I'm going to describe transporter polymorphisms, and I'm going to talk to you about um, pharmacogenomics. Um, but instead of pharmacogenomics focused on drug metabolizing enzymes, I'm going to talk to you about pharmacogenomics uh, that involve polymorphisms in important drug transporters. Um, there's a key reference. This was authored by the International Transporter Consortium, and it was published in, I think, 2000. And uh, 13, um, and it is focused on clinically important transporter polymorphisms. And there have been a wealth of studies published on transporter polymorphisms and the role they may play in drug toxicity, drug response, drug disposition. But this particular reference really distills a lot of information in the literature to the most important transporter polymorphisms that we need to be concerned with at this point. Um, in time. So I have some key points for this section as well. First of all, polymorphisms in BCRP and OATP1B1 play a critical role in variation in drug absorption, disposition, and response. So two transporters, BCRP and OATP1B1, and I'm going to be talking about both of them. Secondly, the ITC recommends a strategic approach to pharmacogenomic studies. And the strategic approach will involve preclinical drug uh, clinical studies, and you may do a drug-drug interaction study as part of the polymorphism study. Um, and then finally, a pharmacogenomic study um, if certain criteria are met. So we'll go through those uh, strategic approaches um, as I go through this part of the lecture. So in curating the literature and in reviewing the literature, the ITC um, used certain criteria to select what they called uh, these very important or essential polymorphisms that people need to be aware of in drug development and in the practice of clinical pharmacology. And the three criteria that we used were, first of all, we put a high bar. That is, the transporter polymorphism had to be significant at genome-wide level significance in a genome-wide association study. And as you recall, a genome-wide association study takes an agnostic approach to discovering genetic variants that underlie drug response, drug disposition, and drug toxicity. So that was our first criteria. It's a very high bar. Many transporter polymorphisms have been studied in candidate gene studies, but they don't make the genome-wide uh, level significance. Um, and I'm not saying that those are not important. Those candidate gene studies are indeed important, but we decided that we really wanted to focus on which were the most important polymorphisms in transporters um, to study. The second criteria is we wanted them to also be significant in multiple candidate gene association studies. So not only in a genome-wide association study, but in multiple candidate gene association studies. And finally, that there should be in vitro studies that document that that transporter polymorphism 
actually exhibits functional changes, that it's not simply in linkage disequilibrium with the real polymorphism, which is causing uh, the variation in drug response, but that it itself is the culprit or causing the variation in drug response. So those are the three criteria. And as I go through the polymorphisms that I'm about to describe, I will go through each one of those criteria and show you the level of evidence uh, that we reviewed and that, are, that is published uh, in that particular paper. So the first polymorphism, transporter polymorphism, that uh, met these criteria, and there are only two, um, at that point in time, there were only two, um, was SLCO1B1 encoding OATP1B1, and it is and, and the polymorphism is a coding polymorphism, and that's what this C means. Coding polymorphism C dot 521T to C. So that means at position 521, um, and that means a nucleotide position in the cDNA 521, there is a polymorphism in which certain individuals carry, instead of a T, uh, have a C. And the RS number of the SNP is shown there. Remember, all SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, have these RS numbers, and those can be found in dbSNP. That polymorphism, in which the T was changed to C, uh, caused an amino acid change in the protein. So valine at position 174 is changed to alanine. So individuals with the T allele have the valine, but the individuals who have the polymorphism, or the C allele, have the alanine. Now I'm showing you here allele frequencies of that polymorphism in three different major ethnic groups in the US. Um, however, the Thousand Genomes Project has the allele frequency of this polymorphism in many more ethnic groups. So you can go to the, th refer to the Thousand Genomes Project and you can find allele frequencies of this polymorphism. Just look it up by gene name and by RS number and you can find the allele frequency in other ethnic groups. But one of the things you'll note, and this is true for drug metabolizing enzymes as well as transporter polymorphisms, is allele frequencies will vary according to ethnicity. Um, so African Americans have a 5% allele frequency of this C allele, um, whereas uh, Europeans and Asians have, you know, 15% allele frequency. The polymorphism is associated with reduced activity, and I'll show you those data. Um, so that's the first one, and I'll describe that in a little more detail. The second one that I'm going to be describing today is ABCG2. Again, this is breast cancer resistance protein, BCRP. Here we again have a coding C, uh, 421, a C to A change. So this is a change to, uh, from a C to an A. There's the RS number. That also results uh, in an amino acid change, uh, glutamine to lysine, Q141K. And as you can see, the allele frequency is very high in Asian Americans, and these are East Asians, at around 30%, and lower in other ethnic groups. And that ABCG2 variant also is associated with reduced function. So let me start with OATP1B1 or SLCO1B1, the valine 174 alanine. So just reminding you here of here's the transporter again on the hepatocyte on the sinusoidal membrane. And it's in a locus together with OATP1B3, and the two transporters work together, and sometimes very difficult. They have very overlapping substrate specificities. However, the polymorphism is in the coding region of OATP1B1. So it's OATP1B1, when we think about a genetic study, um, or, or a pharmacogenetic study that we have to think about, and it's that particular polymorphism in that gene. So first of all, OATP1B1 is a major hepatic transporter for organic anions, um, or acidic drugs. It transports statins. Those are well known to be transported by OATP1B1. Number of anti-diabetic drugs, antiviral agents, anti-cancer drugs. So it transports a variety of different drugs or what you call xenobiotics. So it's a, an important xenobiotic transporter. And both of these are lo located in one particular locus, SLCO1B1 and 1B3 on chromosome 12. Now, the first level of evidence was that it had to be associated with at genome-wide level significance in a genome-wide association study. 
So what you're looking at here um, is a typical Manhattan plot. And I'll just remind you of the essentials of a Manhattan plot. What, what is plotted is the minus log p-value of significance of maybe 500,000 SNPs um, and how significant they were in patients with statin-induced myopathy, and in this case it was simvastatin, and this paper was published in 2008, so it was among the earlier genome-wide association studies. And you can see the, min the, higher the, the higher the peak here, or the higher the data point, the higher the data point, uh, the more significant, because it's a minus log p-value. So this, for example, variant here, uh, the p-value is 10 to the minus 9, 4 times 10 to the minus 9. So definitely reached genome-wide level significance. And it turned out that that variant is SLCL1B1, the RS number I just gave you. It encodes that T to C change, and that is the valine 174 alanine, which we'll describe. And that came up in 2008 as being associated in a large clinical study with statin-induced myopathy at genome-wide level significance. Now you can see it could have been anything was associated with statin-induced myopathy, but this variant really st stood out, and that's been replicated in m additional studies after that. Uh, historical study in 2008. Okay, um, what's very interesting about this particular variant um, is that individuals who are homozygous, remember you get one allele from your father and one from your mother, so individuals that are homozygous for the C or the polymorphic allele, 20% of patients who have statin-induced myopathy in this particular study um, were homozygous for the C allele. That's rather striking. Whereas if you carry the T allele um, or your heterozygotes, much fewer, much lower percentages have statin-induced myopathy. So care being homozygous for this allele really confers risk for statin-induced myopathy. Um, and that, that was shown very nicely in this study. So that's the first level of evidence, genome-wide association level evidence. The second level of evidence that we look for is multiple candidate gene studies, and here is a basic clinical pharmacology study. So what you're looking at on the left plot is simvastatin, um, and simvastatin in patients who are homozygous for that C allele right here. And these are patients here and here who are either heterozygous or homozygous for the T allele. So you can clearly see individuals who are homozygous for the C allele have much higher statin levels on the same dose. Um, and that's because they're not bringing the statin into the liver where the statin can be metabolized. Um, and this has also been studied for other drugs. So the same allele, and now we're looking at the anti-diabetic drug repaglinide. Um, and there again are individuals with the C level allele, uh, again homozygotes, have higher levels of uh, repaglinide compared to either homozygotes or heterozygotes of the uh, T allele. So that's the second level of evidence, candidate gene studies, and really showing a clinical pharmacology mechanism behind the statin-induced myopathy. Clearly, people on simvastatin who have the C allele probably have higher levels of simvastatin, as shown in this particular study over here, and those higher levels put them at risk for statin-induced myopathy. The next level of evidence that we ask is, is really the valine to alanine or the C521 T to C? Um, is that really a functional allele? So these are studies done in the early 2000s by Richard Kim and his group. Um, and what they did here was they studied the function or the uptake of estrin sulfate in cells expressing the reference OATP1B1 and a whole lot of the variant oatp one B1s that they had discovered. And here is what's called the star 5 allele, and the star 5 allele is really the C521 T to C change or the uh, uh, valine to alanine change. And you can see there's reduced estrin sulfate uptake compared to the reference alleles of OATP 1B1. So that's good functional evidence um, that this variant causes a reduced transport rate of estrin sulfate. Um, secondly, they explored the mechanism a little bit further here as to why it causes a reduced uh, function and a reduced transport rate 
of, um, in this case, estrin sulfate. And what they found using Western blot is that the transporter is not expressed on the cell surface. And I'm showing you that here. The transporter is simply not on the cell surface. There's star 5, where the reference is really on the cell plasma membrane. So the reason this transporter is not functioning very well um, is that it's just simply not on the plasma membrane. So those are the third line of evidence. So we've seen genome-wide level ev evidence. We've seen several candidate gene studies showing a clinical pharmacologic mechanism where individuals who have this allele, homozygous for this allele, have higher levels um, of, uh, of statins and repaglinide. And finally, we show functional evidence uh, in the literature that um, there is reduced activity of this particular OATP1 polymorphism. I now want to go to ABCG2. So ABCG2, remember, includes breast cancer resistance protein. The allele here is a Q141K, so it's changing the amino acid. You call those, by the way, non-synonymous variants or missense variants. And I'm reminding you that it's very striking for its um, association, for its presence, if you will, or allele frequency in Asian populations. 30% is a pretty high allele frequency. Um, and remember, it has met these three criteria. And let's go through those three criteria for this one. So first, reminding you that here it is in the intestine. Um, and it's also, by the way, it was also shown in the liver, um, on the canalicular membrane, and it's also present in the kidney. Uh, on the apical membrane. But it's a major intestinal efflux pump, and it's thought to limit the bioavailability or the absorption, the extent of absorption, of a number of drugs that are substrates for it. It transports structurally diverse drugs, including statins, anti-gout anti drugs, and anti-cancer drugs. And it's located on chromosome 4. All right, so let's look first at genome-wide level significance. So in multiple genome-wide association studies, this particular variant um, has been associated with efficacy of statins. So rosuvastatin has a, a pharmacologic effect, if you will, on LDL cholesterol. And individuals who have this variant have a greater effect of rosuvastatin. Um, and this shows, again, we're looking at minus log p-value, so increase the p, increasing uh, peak height or increasing data points, data points at these higher levels, um, have lower p-values, you know, p less than 10 to the minus um, whatever. This, this, um, this GWAS was done in 3,500, um, and ABCG2 was highly significant with um, greater efficacy of... Um, of rosuvastatin on LDL cholesterol. And this shows the p-value 10 to the minus 14, which is well above genome-wide level significance. This is a locus zoom, so you're not looking at all the different um, chromosomes like you were on the OATP1B1 plot with statin-induced myopathy. Now, in clinical pharmacology mechanistic studies, pharmacokinetic studies, if you look, rosuvastatin um, is uh, present, or its concentrations, in individuals who have the K allele, again, who are homozygous, rosuvastatin concentrations are higher compared to individuals who are heterozygous or uh, for the reference allele or are individuals who are um, homozygous for the reference allele. So if you have the variant allele, you get higher drug levels of rosuvastatin. Why? possibly because more rosuvastatin is absorbed. That efflux pump can't ef doesn't efflux as well. And when you have this variant, when you have the K allele, uh, you're not effluxing uh, rosuvastatin as well, and more rosuvastatin is being absorbed. I say increase F, which means increased bioavailability of rosuvastatin, which accounts for those higher uh, drug levels of rosuvastatin. And those of you who are familiar with FDA labeling know that rosuvastatin is labeled um, to give a lower dose of this particular statin to Asians. And it's probably, although that still is controversial, because Asians 
have a higher allele frequency of this particular variant. So they, the Asians that have this variant, will have higher concentrations of resuvastatin, so you may want to give them a lower dose. Okay, so the question is, is there mechanistic data that suggests that this particular ABCG2 variant or BCRP variant um, has lower functional activity? And so this is a study where they have identified ABCG2 using an antibody on the plasma membrane. You can see the reference transporter is highly expressed on the plasma membrane, shown in green, and these are cells, um, uh, cell, cellular studies. However, the variant um, transporter has a much lower expression on the plasma membrane, so that's why it results in reduced function. It's simply not on the plasma membrane, or less of it is on the plasma membrane, to efflux uh, uh, the drug. And they did further st uh, studies asking the question of why is less on the plasma membrane, and finding that that's because the, the variant transporter, the one with the lysine at position 140. Uh, one um, is subject to more increased lysosomal and proteosomal degradation, so it's just simply not on the plasma membrane. So those are the lines of evidence for um, ABC uh, G2 and for OATP1B1. So now how do you do a pharmacogenomic study, and especially a targeted clinical mechanistic uh, pharmacogenomic study? Well. We recommend, and this is the International Transporter Consortium's paper, um, but there's a recommendation to collect DNA in all phases of clinical studies, phase one, phase two, post-marketing. Collect DNA. If you don't have the DNA and you haven't appropriately consented the, the subjects or the patients, um, um, you can't do the pharmacogenomic study. We also recommend some preclinical studies done first. So let's start with the preclinical studies. What do you do? Well, the first thing you have to do if you want to know whether to do a pharmacogenomic study related to OATP1B1 or BCRP is ask the question of whether your drug is actually a substrate of OATP1B1 or BCRP. So here we say do an in vitro assay in a transfected cell line expressing OATP1B1 or BCRP and ask whether it's a substrate of the transporter. If it is a substrate, then you move on. If it's really not a substrate, or if it's a weak substrate and you don't feel that that transport is playing a major role or contributing a lot to the disposition of your new drug, um, you may not consider uh, a pharmacogenomic study. We also next recommend that you consider doing a drug-drug interaction study. Um, so let's say cyclosporin, as we know, is an inhibitor and it inhibits many things, but it also inhibits OATP1B1. Uh, it also inhibits OATP1B3. So it's sort of what you might call a dirty inhibitor. Um, if you do a drug-drug interaction study with cyclosporin, you will for sure be inhibiting OATP1B1 and also other transporters. And if you get a result that looks like this, here are the plasma levels of your new drug in the presence and absence of cyclosporin, and there's not much of an effect, um, with a drug-drug interaction, you're likely not going to get an effect of a genetic polymorphism. If a drug which is inhibiting the transporter fully, maybe fully, but quite a lot, and other transporters can't cause this drug-drug interaction, um, you're likely not going to, it's a small effect, and if, especially if you have a wide therapeutic window, don't bother with the clinical pharmacogenomic study. However, if with the drug-drug interaction study, you get some clue that, in fact, with cyclosporin, drug levels go up. That means individuals that carry genetic polymorphism, their levels will also go up, probably. And so now you might want to do that clinical pharmacogenomic uh, study. So we think a drug-drug interaction study, you may have to do that anyway because your drug is a substrate of OATP1B1 and it's recommended you do the DDI, drug-drug interaction study. So do the drug-drug interaction study first and get some information. And if you get a large effect, and especially if you have a narrow therapeutic window drug, genetic polymorphisms could play a role in higher drug levels which may lead to uh, drug toxicity.
you need a strategic design here, and we just and here I'm not going to prescribe or dis describe uh, clinical pharmacogenomic study design. But when do you do the study? Do you do it in phase one? Do you do it in phase three? Do you do it post marketing? How do you power the study? You have to have people who are homozygous for that variant of interest because, as you saw, the big effects on drug levels occur with. Uh, in individuals who are homozygous. Which ethnic group do you study? Um, certainly, if you're looking at the BCRP variant, which is present at high allele frequencies in East Asians, you may want to do the drug-drug interaction study in East Asians because you'll have a large population of people who harbor that genetic variant. And then you need an important data analysis plan. And this definitely requires working with statisticians, geneticists, et cetera, for, for the clinical pharmacogenomic study. So let me review our key points on the polymorphisms. First, polymorphisms in BCRP and OATP1B1 play a role in variation in drug absorption, disposition, and response. The International Transporter Consortium recommends a strategic approach to pharmacogenomic studies where you start in preclinical cell-based studies and ask simple questions like, is your drug or is the drug that you would like to study a substrate of OATP1 or BCRP? You consider doing a drug-drug interaction study because you may get information on how large that effect is going to be. And then you carefully design your pharmacogenomic study, power it, make sure you have homozygotes etc. So hopefully I've talked about two genetic variants here in membrane transporters. There are others that are on the horizon, by the way, that clinical pharmacologists will have to be aware of with time. And it, it's very important that as you look at the data in the literature and make decisions yourself on whether a polymorphism is, is important, you ask some of those fundamental questions. Does the polymorphism associate with drug levels? Um, do, are, is there cellular evidence that the polymorphism is actually causal, or could it be in linkage with a causal polymorphism, et cetera. Now let me summarize the final points in this, um, in my talk. So first, in the area of basic transporter biology, um, I want to emphasize two points. There are two major superfamilies, SLC and ABC. Um, that you need to be aware of, that the kinetics of transporters are, all transporters, exhibit saturability and inhibition. And the ABC transporters can be inhibited, and so can the SLC transporters, and they will saturate as well. Remember that the SLC transporters um, are facilitated transporters and do not rely directly on hydrolysis of ATP. They may be secondary active transporter in which movement of their substrate is coupled to the movement of an ion like sodium, and that ion gradient is created by a transporter which may be directly dependent on ATP hydrolysis like sodium potassium ATPase. The ABC transporters, in contrast, directly rely on hydrolysis of ATP. They can actively pump their substrates against a concentration gradient, and the ones we talk about in the human genome that are most important are efflux pumps. Transporters may mediate drug-drug interactions, and here, instead of every transporter in the world, you do have to be aware of the transporters because your particular drug may interact with a transporter that isn't so well known. But the transporters that generally clinical pharmacologists need to be aware of are PGP, BCRP, in the kidney, OCT1, OCT2, excuse me, MATE1, MATE2K, OAT1 and OAT3, and in the liver, OATP1B1 and 1B3. And maybe at a later date, OCT1, but we'll see. Decision trees are uh, available from the FDA, the EMA. These decision trees really help you use in vitro studies uh, to inform the conduct of a clinical drug-drug interaction study. And I, sh I went through one, but you should go through other decision trees um, in your education as a clinical pharmacologist. And finally, um, transporter polymorphisms play a role in variation in drug safety, drug efficacy, drug, um, drug levels. And I highlighted two, OATP1B1 and BCRP, 
those two particular polymorphisms. However, you need to be aware that there are other polymorphisms under study, and over the course of your career, there will likely be other polymorphisms that are uh, determined and associated with variation in drug response. Finally, a strategic design. We recommend a strategic design going through all phases of drug development from in vitro or preclinical all the way uh, through post-marketing um, in the design of a clinical pharmacogenomic study. I hope this has been a helpful discussion and lecture on transporter biology and what's important for clinical pharmacologists.